Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, I'll be wrapping up my three-part video review series on the PT Actuator 5DOF motion system. I've already published part one and part two, so make sure you also check those out. Here, I will be finalizing the PT Actuator 5DOF build and put it through some proper testing to see how it does. So, let's get to it. All right, so I want to take a little bit of time to show you guys the ongoing updates that PT Actuator makes to their systems. Now, this is a bracket for the traction loss actuator, all right? And you can see how free it moves. And the reason it swings or is able to do that is so that the actuator itself can rotate through the arc of our traction loss path. So remember, there's a pivot on the front of the chassis, so it's like a big pendulum. So we're just swinging with through an arc in the back part there. Now, if you did not have this movement in a bracket, which a lot of systems I've seen don't, they just have the bracket sitting there and they have a rod end on the end of the actuator uh, piston, that can take a little bit of that up, of course, because it's a rod end. But this is much better. It allows the whole actuator body to rotate through that arc. So there's no loading or side loading forces on the piston that goes inside the housing as it goes in and out and goes through that traction loss. And I'll show you again the video that I did of that so you can see when I'm a little bit clearer what I'm talking about. You're being free like that to move you know, backwards, or left or right rather in this case, uh, is a very good thing as far as durability and long life of your actuators is concerned. Right, so the only problem was that this was a little bit loose. All right, there's a little bit, there's a little bit too much lash in this system that they have, the one that originally came with it. And that would make some noise when the actuator moved through it. In other words, stopped its stroke and moved in the other direction. So if it was pushing out, then the bracket would be pushing, if, let's say the actuator was pushing this way towards me, then the opposite force would rock this back, right? And then when it came to the end of the stroke, whatever that happened to be, and it rotated and it started in the other direction, it would rock this bracket the other way. And you can hear as I'm doing that, hear that? It makes a little funkin' noise. Now, of course, this is amplified once we securely mount this to this 8020 profile that we use in the frame where this is being mounted. So it actually sounded like something was loose or something mechanically was wrong because it would get a knock anytime it would change direction, in or out, didn't matter, it would still make the same sound. So he's changed this with a different with another bracket, but I wanted to show you the mechanics of this and how this works. And we also have a hole here in this bracket, as you can see that allows us access to the bolts. And if you saw the build video, you know what that is. And we rotate it over to the next hole once we get to the next bolt and so forth and so on until we have all four bolts in. So I'm just, I've showed you that again because it's a little different on this one also. So what I'm gonna do is take the screw, or the bolt really, what this is, a screw bolt, out of here. And I've already had to heat it up and, and I think they put rec <laughs> Loctite in here, something very vicious. So I had to heat it up with a heat gun and before I could actually get it to come loose. Now, it's loose now, so I just want to tighten it back down so it wasn't so loose when I was demonstrating what I was talking about as far as the lash or the looseness. Okay, so we'll take this out so we make a lot of noise. And there is the bolt that holds that in. You can see it has a metal shank on it for strength there where it actually goes down into this part of the bracket. And then underneath, we have a bearing. Now this is a ball bearing, but it's a nice ball bearing. It's almost like a sealed bearing, but it works differently. And I'm going to pull the top race off. You can see I kind of push it on one side and I can lift it off like this. And you can see that this top part has a groove in it that we call a race. Okay. And that allows the round, let me give you a better look at it that way. See the groove there? That allows the round ball bearings that are in here to slide around in that groove. And not only that, but we also have a carriage or carrier, if you will, for the ball bearings themselves. Right, in the back. And this is what the better ball bearing units, this is how they're built. So they don't go flying everywhere when you have to take it out and lube them or do some kind of maintenance or, or anything like that. So in the bottom of this, there's the other part of this, okay? The race. They press the race in after, then again, this is a CNC piece of aluminum they machined out. And you can see the race down the bottom there, right? So yeah, that is a system that requires a little bit more lash than we want. And I can actually, well, it's not that much lash. It's really just the way that the ball bearing system works, I think. 
You can see it kind of spins around there. All right, so that's how this system works. So he's changed to a different system, and I'm, I'm not pulling this one apart because I'm going to use this. <laughs> so uh, you're going to have to believe me or, or, or trust me here on what's going on with this one. Now, this one has a sealed bearing pressed into it, and I doubt you'll be able to see it very well. If I do it like this, we can get a, a better look at it. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's see. Yeah, you're just not going to be able to see it very well. You can see the steel washer that rides on top of the inner race of that pressed in bearing. You might be able to see it a little bit. It's hard for me to tell when I'm looking at this little monitor on my camera. But anyway, it's pressed into, again, a CNC aluminum machine bit. Now, it's harder to move, but it still moves, of course, right? But it's just a little bit stiffer. There's hardly any lash in this at all. When you push it back and forth, like I did the other one, yeah, nothing going on here, okay? So I think that's going to cure the knock, no doubt, that knocking sound that we were getting out of this bracket. And he's done another little change to it. Now, instead of just having one hole in it for access to your bolt for mounting, now all four holes are in there for the mounting, right? So we don't have to turn it anymore as we start mounting our bolts, which is kind of nice. It's a nice convenient feature, if you will. And again, this has the same kind of bolt in it. And you can, I don't know, it's going to show up here, I doubt it. But there is some red, you can barely see some red Loctite coming out around the hole, around the, the threads there seeping through, if you will. Anyway, so this is going to change. So when the, we're pushing back and forth, there's going to be no more rocking that we had in this system here. Because it's just, it's just a looser system with ball bearings. And even in the seal bearing, even though it operates very similarly, it's, it, it's different. Okay, especially a seal bearing all being all metal like that. All right, so that's about it. I just want to show you how this works and the update. And yeah, so we're going to go ahead and get this mounted. But before I do that, I'm going to show you another update that he's made to the system. Another update I wanted to talk about is some grommets for the rod ends. You can see how the rod ends laying over to the left here. It, once you first start up your actuators, it always does it. It turns to the left because it's a ball screw assembly inside. So it actually turns on these. So you don't want it to do that. You want it to stay straight up. So PT Actuator came up with a mod or an update, and now we have these grommets that we're going to put in these spacers. And that's what you're seeing here. These are the spacers that go into the ball of the rod end. And these grommets fit on the outside of those spacers. All right? And they sit flush there. You can see the metal still sticking out a little bit. And what you want to do is obviously put a grommet on both ends of these spacers or inserts. And then what we're going to do is once we have them on there, is I wanted to lube them up a little bit, and that's what's recommended. This is pure silicone grease, 100% pure. You can actually eat this stuff. <laughs> so I went ahead and applied some of this to the outside, and of course, I'll also be applying it to the inside of the grommet. And this is just to eliminate any, any squeaking or anything like that that might come up. Plus, it's going to make it easier to install. Like you see here, I'm installing the TL actuator. You can see the grommets are not on here. This was the original install, and yeah, but the spacers are in there, and you'll just install it the exact same way. It's going to be a little tighter when you install it, but this is the end result. You can see the grommets in there against the metal bracket now, and they're keeping the rod in nice and straight, so job done. I'm going to install a floorboard, and I wanted to show you guys how I did this. And the reason I'm installing it is because it's easier to step in, obviously, if you have a floorboard, and... There will be other people coming in and climbing in and out of the cockpit. It'll just make it easier for them, too. So what I started with was two 40 by 40 series profiles here, cut to just under 500 millimeters in width. And you can see here how I have them arranged. And I'm running two corner brackets, and these are gusseted corner brackets, on each end to support these profiles. Because I want to make sure that no matter who steps on it, it's not going to come apart or fall through. <laughs> I want to make sure it can withstand a lot of weight. Now, to keep things quiet, you can see I have these pads here. Now, this is a, a neoprene rubber that uh, has an adhesive side to it that I have a bunch of that, and I, I use it for different things. This will keep the floorboard from rattling because I'll be using a metal plate. So you want to make sure that you have something in there to keep that from happening. And, of course, I have my T-nuts, and these are 6 mil T-nuts installed into the channels, and that's where I'm going to be, obviously, affixing the floorboard. So next what we'll see is the actual floorboard installed. And you can see I'm using a diamond plate type of aluminum here. And on the back, I have some socket head cap six mils. 
because there won't be any feet back there. All, you know, all the people will be stepping is on the front. So I've used button heads, as you can see here, for the front of the floorboard to make sure that it's a low profile so nobody gets hung up on it with their shoe. But in the back, it really doesn't matter because, you know, you're not stepping in that way. And you, you, more than likely, your foot's never going to slide back like that because the pedals are the other direction. So yeah, this is how I installed it. Of course, there's other ways to go about doing this. But once this is securely fastened, it will not vibrate. There will be no, won't be any rattling noises or anything like that. It's a pretty simple thing to do. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people might want to do this to a cockpit. So I thought I'd go ahead and let you see how I did it. I wanted to show you guys my belt tensioning system that I use when I have a surge element in the chassis like this PT actuator chassis has. Now, this fixture is actually designed by, originally designed, as far as I know, by JC at JCL Racing. And it came on his JCL cockpit that he has the surge element in. And I did a review on that a few months back. Well, I, I held on to this fixture because I liked it so much. And I'm just going to explain to you guys, and I did explain in that video too, but we'll just go over it again because anybody with Surge can build one of these. And it has some advantages over a typical belt tensioner system. Um, typically, a belt tensioner system would be the belts, the shoulder harnesses coming back down like this and then attaching to a point somewhere down in the, if you have a point to attach it to. Some people even bring them straight down the seat and attach them. Uh, it would be attached down here somewhere, right? So it's pulling straight down like that with some springs or something in it, or maybe even a motor down here, right? With some pulleys on it or rollers that can put the tension on the, the shoulder belt, which works fine. Nothing wrong with that designs and, and the way they work. But there are a couple of better ways to do it as far as optimizing how it operates. And that is, first off, we'll, we'll take a look at the shoulder assembly. Well, before we get to that, I'll tell you what, let me just show you how this, his, this fixture looks and how it was assembled. It's pretty simple, really. I'm using some large corner brackets here on both sides of this piece of profile 4080 that comes out the back, right? And the length of that is variable depending how far back your seat is going to be. And again, that's all subjective depending on what you're going to need. So it could be any length. It doesn't have to be the length you see here. In fact, I'm not going to tell you what it is because it doesn't matter. It's all variable. So we have those corner brackets, but you could use regular corner brackets in here, a pair of them, and it would still do the job, I think. And I have, obviously, you can see the other one sitting on the other side. And the one over there is set up the exact same way, of course. And we also see two corner brackets over here that are holding the upright. But I also have two of the corner brackets over here on the top. Get a little adjustment here. And you can see these guys sitting here. And I also have some that are on the bottom right here. So I have a total of six corner brackets attaching this upright to the rest of the assembly. And I don't think that's overkill because there is going to be some stress on them as this chassis gets pushed forward and the belts pull on this. But this is the only mount point right here on this, on this particular case. It's on the surge chassis or the surge um, base, if you will. But that's the only mount point to the chassis. It's free floating after that. And of course, this side is assembled exactly the same way. Then we have a middle bar up here. And this is for attaching your seat belts to. It does not take any force. So in other words, I have it clamped down on the top of this, on the top bar up here, but I'll show you that in a minute. But this is just where you can affix your belts and adjust things as far as length and so forth. Now, if we go around the side here, this is the waist belt tensioner. And this can be any length you want to also. It doesn't really matter. It depends on, again, the application and what you need. And you can see this one's actually a bit longer than what I need. So I could actually use a much shorter piece, but I just had these pieces, so I used them. The key here is obviously we're, we're attaching the waist belt here and we have this guy. And this is a motor mount, basically. And you can see it moves, right? It's rubber. And based on where I attach this seat belt, I put a washer on the other side if I was going to come out to here and another nut so it would stay on the outside. You can act, we'll have more leverage if I take this and attach it to the outside of this nut. In other words, move it all over and then clamp it on the inside so it can't go back in. We'll have more leverage so it would bend even more. So you have some tunability here is what I'm trying to say, all right? It's not just a rubber grommet here or a rubber piece and you just forget about it. You can tune it to match what you're feeling on the shoulder harness. At least that's the point or that's the, the idea. <laughs> so, yeah, that's very effective. And, of course, you, have to, you can adjust it along the rail anywhere you need it. Now let's go up the uprights. We're going to go ahead and travel all the way up. And this is where the T-bar or the top bar is. 
And this is where I'm clamping down the seat belts. And so these are tightly affixed and these seat belts cannot move. You can't pull them, right? You can only pull them this way. Now this keeps it at the right angle that I want it to be at when I get pulled on, when the shoulder belts get pulled. Now, typically you'll see again, like I said before, people will attach these belts all the way down the back of the seat, maybe on the chassis down here somewhere and maybe have some springs or another motor with some pulleys on it that can actually turn back and forth and pull those belts, which is an effective design. There's nothing wrong with it. But the, it, the thing is, if you're in a real car, and this is a much more comfortable thing also, the belts in a real race car come back to the roll bar somewhere, and they're usually at an angle like this, okay? They're coming back. So they're not coming straight down like this. So it'd be better to have a shoulder harness system that had some kind of a system up here with rollers on it that would keep them straight for a while before they went down so that they pull back on your shoulders. Because if you're pulling down on your shoulders all the time like this, it compresses your actual shoulder, right? The muscle, your neck muscles up there in the shoulder, it just keeps compressing them, which actually is irritating and it's tiresome and it makes you sore <laughs> depending on how long you're in there. So this is a much better solution because now when you have it like this, the belt gets pulled straight back, all right? Or you get, the belt gets tensioned straight back. And when I'm sitting in here, I'm actually, the body, and my body is in here, the belt's more like this angle, okay? So it's not sitting down on this like this, it's sitting more like this. And I'll show you guys some footage of me uh, driving it just so you can see the angle on it, all right? So yeah, you can see the angle is pretty much straight. So when it pulls back on my shoulder, it's just pulling the front of my shoulder, not pulling down on the shoulder muscle there, that neck muscle that goes from your shoulder up to your neck. Much more realistic feeling to me. And of course, that's all subjective. But yeah, uh, the beauty of this whole system is it's a static assembly. There is no wiring. There's no motors. There's no drivers to drive the servo motor. There's no uh, adjustments in software to tune it. It just works. And of course, the waist belts being pulled at the same time are really like a huge step up from just having the shoulder harnesses moving. The waist belt just, um, when that's pulling the same as your shoulder harness is, when you're braking, it's just, uh, you're there. I mean, it's so immersive, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's, um, it's just something, that if you've never tried that before, you get in this seat and you have the whole harness basically pulling you like you would be getting pulled in braking in a real race car. The G-forces would be pressing into your waist belts and, of course, into your shoulder belts. And this belt here is made to keep everything from riding up and moving around. So that's essentially what this belt is for, to keep the, the other belts attached and safe. And of course, keep you from coming through this way too. I mean, there's a safety part of it also. But you don't have to worry about moving that belt, all right? Because this bottom of this, this part of the belt, the, what we call the, the five, six point, and it's either a five or a six point. This is a six point because it has two belts and it gives you room for your, your, your important parts not to get squeezed like a single belt does. <laughs> so yeah, this is a, the way to run it. Um, you know, all I can say is it's simple. It's very, very effective. And by the time you buy the profile and build something like this, and then you go buy motors and pulleys and stuff, I'm not saying that's not fun to build something like that and to do it yourself. It, it, element of that is, is, again, something that hobbyists love to do. But again, just having the shoulder harness move and not the waist belts it's almost like it's being the, the everything's being pulled across you when you when that happens. You're not really being pressed back into the seat like you do. You're, in other words, the bottom of your butt is not being pressed into the seat like it does with the waist belts pulling too. So even a an actuator system that has a, a a waist and a shoulder pulling, then that's cool, right? As long as again you want something up here to keep this from pulling straight down on your shoulder when it pulls, or even at an angle like that. Anything less than this. It's going to put pressure on that muscle that's between your shoulder and your neck, and it's not very comfortable in long races or long stints. So there you have it. Uh, I really enjoy, as you can probably tell, I really like this, this assembly here. I mean, this fixture just works like gold, and it's, it's so simple. Once you have it up, it's done, and yeah, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Maybe go check the bolts. <laughs> so pretty simple, but very, very effective system. Now I'm going to show you guys how I set this switch up for my preferences. And I'm going to go over and just go ahead and start turning the dial here. A little dark in here, so the video might be a little noisy, but I think the screen's going to be fine as far as watching what I'm doing. And here we are. This is the function of the KLM. And as you can see, it's sitting at park standby switch. 
Now, if you press this knob once, it'll change to the menu and give us some options. So you see currently it's park standby switch, or if I turn the knob, it gives me another option of e-stop only, which I don't want. So we're going to stay with this. So I press it again, and now it gives me either hold position as far as the function of the e-stop, or I can go for kill power, right? I want it to hold position. So I'm going to leave that and press it once. And now it'll give me the switch type option, normal open and normal closed. I want normal open. So I'll press it one more time, and that sets it up. So now all those options are set the way I want them. So I have to go one more thing. I'm going over one more menu window by turning it one notch. And you can see now I'm at function of FSW. And it is hold position. Again, I'll press it once. And these are our options, hold position or park motors. I want hold position, so I'm going to go back to hold position, press it once, and now it's set. So that's what I want, hold position on the FSW and on the function of the KLM. I want it to be, and I'll go ahead and check them. Park standby switch is the function I want, not e-stop only. I want it to hold position, and I want my switch type to be open, normal open. And there you have it. Now that we have everything programmed in our PT actuator controller for our kill switch or emergency stop, now we can actually test it. Now I'm not in a game right now, so we'll, we'll take a look at it again when I'm actually running in the game, which really the only difference is going to be is the green light will be on because the actuators will be receiving telemetry from the game. So right now it's in a parked position because yellow means parked. Now I'm going to give you guys a shot of a page out of the PDF manual that will show you what each light condition should mean. So we're at yellow now, and of course that means parked. Now if I push the yellow button, it's actually going to raise the rig up into its ready position. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And you see how it came up. Now you also see that we have a flashing red button. But the, the flashing yellow button means it's now in standby mode. But the flashing red means that we forced it offline. Okay, if you look at that little uh, guide that I gave you. So blinking red, forced offline. All right? So I can actually go in and press the standby, or the yellow button out of standby, and it will actually lower it, and our red light goes out. And our yellow light comes back on. All right? So we're again parked. Right. Simple enough, right? Now, if I hit the emergency button, the red light will come on, hopefully. <laughs> there we go. So a solid red light, and, it can, and I'm not sure how well it's showing on video, but it is red. A solid red light means that you have an e-stop activated. So if I was in a situation where I wanted to stop the motion, then I would slap the e-stop, obviously, and that would be it. Now, if I release the e-stop, you can see I go back in standby. Now, I'm going to put it back in, or rather in parked. I'm going to put it back in standby mode with the red blinking now. All right, so if I push the button now in this condition, watch what happens. See, the yellow went out, so I'm no longer in standby, and I am on solid red now, which means I've activated the e-stop. So this just gives me indications of what's going on. It's kind of nice to have these indications with just instead of just having the e-stop button itself. I'm going to go ahead and release that. And once I do the red light starts blinking again because it, it goes back to its forced offline and my yellow is in standby. And of course, if I press it one more time, it'll nice and gently park itself on the bottom. So that's a brief run through on what the light indicators mean when you're not in game. And now we'll just take a look at it while I'm actually running in game. Now I'm actually in a game. I'm in iRacing and you can see that I'm ready to go racing and the green light is on, right? So, and this is the, if I was driving, you'd be seeing the exact same thing. So if I hit the emergency stop or the kill button, the red light comes on, which means that I went, I actually used the emergency kill button to stop the motion and it will hold that motion. It doesn't park, all right? I don't want this thing to park because if I'm in an odd position, when I hit that emergency stop, I don't want it to jerk back into a horizontal position and then, and then go down into the par position. I'd rather it just stay where it is until I can get out of the cockpit or figure out what I want to do as far as get it going again. Now, if I release the emergency stop, 
you can see my red light is still on, all right? Which means that's, that's the condition I was in. So I can press the yellow, and now these two will start blinking. I press the yellow again, and of course, blinking red was, means forced offline, and blinking yellow means standby. So I'm gonna take it back out of standby now, and you can see I'm back to green. So now I'm ready to go rolling again, right? So everything's ready to go. I get a green light. I know I'm good when I have that green light and I can continue on. Again, it's kind of neat to have this kill switch because of the light indicator system. It allows me to see exactly what the conditions are of the unit or the system in general as far as where my actuators are doing just by looking at the lights here. So, yeah, I think that'll do it for the Bajor emergency stop or kill button. I wanted to show you guys the AMC config tool, and I'm gonna go ahead, I got a shortcut to it over here on my desktop, and open that up. And it lets us set some, some configurations as far as the PT actuator controller that's running the Thanos board. And it's very simple, really. Uh, once you open it up like this, you go to port dropdown, because we have to tell it which port our motion system is communicating with the computer on. And there it is, COM5. So I have COM1 up here, but I know it's COM5, so I'm gonna click on that. Then I'm going to tell it to open the port. And you can see I get populated with the information. So what this tool is doing is reading the controller, all right, and letting me know what my settings are to a certain extent. Not every single setting there is. But the reason I'm showing you this is it's great for tuning your spike filter that comes with the Thanos controller board. And you don't have to get out of the cockpit and go over to your controller board and turn the dial or, or wherever you have it mounted, your board mounted. So this is very cool that you can do that. And you can see the spike filter is, is actually enabled here, of course. And we have a fine tune range and a spike level. What you really want to concern yourself with is the spike level. This fine tune range is nothing more than how far our spike level gets adjusted every time we touch or we click on one of these arrows on the right or the left. If I go left, of course, that's down. So it goes to 1540. If I go right, it goes up to 1560. So I'm going up 20 points in increments every time I touch one of those. I can actually change that by changing the fine tune range over here. If I go down on the fine tune range, it'll go up instead of 20, it goes up 19, all right? So it, again, it's just a fine tune range. And I, most people, I imagine, will just leave it at 5100 because the way this thing acts, the filter reacts, or it, 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 as far as the effect is, yeah, 20 every click is, is well enough for me anyway. I don't have any problem with it. So back to the spike level itself. Now this spike filter is so that when you hit a barrier or you crash into a wall that you don't get thrown out of the cockpit or you don't get a super hard jerking shot to your body. <laughs> and not only that, but it helps your motion system last longer because you know when, when you take hard hits that these motion systems are capable of delivering, then obviously it's not the best thing for actuator as far as the long life of it goes, right? <laughs> Shorter life cycles. So. This is adjustable, and it depends on which car you're in, what track you were in, that, that kind of thing. It's just, it's one of those things that's just adjustable. And you'll know the first time you hit a wall if you need more or less spike level, if you will. All right, so right now it's at 1560. And if I get a spike that's over 1560, what'll happen is the filter kicks in and it slows the motion down at that point until we get back to the recovery mode or the park mode or wherever we have as far as holding position, and then we'll be back to sp the regular speed again. But usually if you hit a barrier wall, you're gonna be resetting, resetting your car anyway if you hit it that hard. So yeah, 1560. So if I get a jolt when I hit the wall that is too hard, I don't like it, then what I will do is I will actually bring it down so that at 1540, it goes in effect and I won't feel that extra 20 points there. All right, pretty simple when you think about it. If um, I hit the wall and, and it slows me down, or no, rather not hit a wall, let's say I'm going over some hard curbing, I'm going over some sausages, right? And it, the spike filter jumps, kicks in. That's not what I want, right? I don't want that to happen. Unless it's a terrible, uh, <laughs> it's a terrible sausage that's really you know, bumping me bad, then it, it might be the case. But normally, yeah, hard curbing or something like that, yeah, you, you don't want the filter to kick in at that point. So I would raise it a little bit. Okay, and keep raising it until I went over that same curbing or something similar to it in the track. And yeah, it didn't do it. So it's, it's a little tuning thing that you can do here. I've seen these as high as 1800 on some cars or some settings that I've seen guys that, that have on their 
uh, spike filters. So again, it's a variable thing. And each system, each motion system, uh, doesn't matter where it comes, which manufacturer it comes from, even if it's a do-it-yourself type of thing, each one's going to be a little bit different here on how it reacts. So that's what this tuning is all about. All right, so the spike level for the spike filter. Very simple thing, little tool to use here. It's a very cool tool. I don't have to get out of my cockpit or if I have my controller board, you know, mounted on the side of my cockpit somewhere, I don't have to reach over and change it, you know, when I want to change it. I can actually do it in here. And I can go in and hit the save button and it says nothing to save because that's where I have my settings, 1560, right? So if it'd been a, if I made a real change here and I clicked OK, it, it would pop up and say settings have been, or rather your settings have been saved and then you're good to go. It'll be that one every time you start uh, your motion system. So again, while you're in the car, a different track, a different car, you might want to play with this. So it's something that I, you can have up here open on your extra monitor or you can alt tab into it if you don't have an extra monitor. Very cool tool. To run your motion simulator in sim tools, you're going to need what is called a plugin. And you have to buy these plugins. One way or another, you have to purchase them. And there's different ways to go about getting them. Now, I'm going to go over here. You see my browser's open. I've already done a search for SimTools plugin download. And it got me over to the xsimulator.net site. So I'm going to click on that. And it takes me to the site. And I'm going to go up here to the top and go to downloads. And we have forums here, by the way. And you can join the forums. In fact, you, you might want to do that. It's a, great, it's a great site. Join the forum. There's lots of conversations about all kinds of motion stuff. So it, it's, a, it's a great place to be a member of. I'm a member, and yeah, you, you can earn tokens and things or gold coins or whatever they call them if you're a member and you participate. Now, I'm going to go to this download tab here. If I wanted to download a new plugin for a game that I want to try, then I would search through here and try to find it, all right? So obviously, we can just keep panning through down here, or I can actually do a search and try to find what I'm looking for. I'm just going to go down real quick and click on one here and just see if I can download it. I'll go with a set of Corsa. All right, so there's the plugin. All right, and it tells you a little bit about the plugin. It has some reviews, updates on it, things like that. And it says download is not available right here, right? Because I'm not signed in, okay? And if, you don't, if you're not a member, you would be getting the same thing. So I'm gonna click on download not available. You must be logged in to do that. Okay, okay, fine, fine. I'm gonna go back. And what I'm gonna do is go over here to download. And see what happens then and it still came it won't let me download it right so down here you can see it says get access to the plugins here and here's what happens you click on that and you're redirected over here so you can be a supporter of the site without being a member of the com community rather and that's $29 for two years worth so you can download all the content you want to for $29 for two years right or you can do a $59 one-time premium and just have a lifetime access to everything. Or you can join the forum, like I said before, and get some coins uh, accumulated by participating in the forums. And you can get them for free. So I'm going to go back up and let's see. Well, let me accept their privacy policy here. And I'm going to go back to where we were. And I am going to scroll up and see if I can log in here. And there I am. And I'm going to log in. All right. So now that I'm logged in, you can see I can download it. All right. Because if you look up here, I've got a balance of 85 coins. They're not gold coins. They're just coins, apparently. <laughs> I forget. There's so many sites with different coin types that they offer. So this one's just coins. Okay. So I've got 85 coins because of the I've been participating in this forum for a long time. And now I'm free to download it. Right. So then, of course, I would just normally download it. And as I, and you can see... I don't know how well you're going to see here. I'm going to kind of highlight it here. It's a zip file. All right. And that's what we need to use the plugin updater from SimTools. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and say download now. And then I would download it or save it to wherever I want it to go to. All right. All right. So I'm going to cancel that because I've already got it. So we've got our plugin for our game. So let's get out of the browser here. And once you load SimTools, and you will get a, cop a copy of SimTools, you download that when you get your PT Actuator system. And depending on the system you buy, it'll, whether or not you will be able to get a professional license, or you might have to buy it. So, and, and they're like $69 or something that for the license, depending on the system that you buy from him. Of course, the higher end system like this one that we're reviewing, you will get a free license. <laughs> Pretty cool. 
So we've, I've already installed SIM tools, as you might imagine, and I'm going to go in here down to my SIM tools and click on that. And you can see the drop down. I have a game engine, a game manager, and a plugin updater in my registration because I've already registered that's there. So I'm, I want the plugin updater. So I'm going to click on that. And there it is. So the, the thing to do here is just drag and drop your plugins. All right. And I'm going to go into my, let's see, where is it? That's not where I want it. My PTL actuator kit. I've got some plugin pr profiles up here. And let's see, it's at a Corsa. I got DSX, which is uh, Digital Combat Simulator, iRacing, Race Room. Let's see, let me cl double click on Race Room. I may not have loaded this one already. So, what I'm going to do is just, as you can see, that's a zip file. I don't know how well this is showing up in, in this 1080 frame that I got, but all you do is take it and drag it over to this and let go. Boom. Files installed, installation complete. That easy. I'm done. All right, I will have to patch it once I get into Sim Tools, but as far as the plugin itself, it is there. So now I can go into Race Room and use it, and my motion will work. Pretty cool, huh? Couldn't be any simpler. So there it is, the plugin updater. That's the first thing you probably need to do before you start setting your, your motion system up. At least, you know, that's the way I do it. I just get all the plugins I want, and then I'll go in and set it up, and then I'll patch it because once I'm in the game manager and the game engine, they're I'm working between those all the time, so I might as well just do this first before I get into those. Because you can't use the plugin updater if you have the game engine running. So yeah, that's why. All right, so there it is, the Sim Tools plugin updater. Now that we have our plugins installed, now I'm going to open Sim Tools. Now, before I actually open Sim Tools, I'm going to need some information about how my computer is communicating with the controller, the PT actuator controller that's controlling the motion system over the USB port. So I'm going to go down into devices and printers. I'm going to pull that up. Now there's other ways to do this. You can go through device manager in Windows 10 and look at it that way. But this is more of a graphical user friendly kind of thing. So I thought I'd show this. First off, you can see that there's a lot of devices on this particular computer. I have a Bodner steering wheel. It's just called steering wheel. Asher racing button plate. I've got my load cell interface, which is the Bodner load cell amplifier uh, board. And that is for my Wave Italy pedals. I got an HE Sim handbrake. I got a SimWorks Pro series controls. But if you notice, they're all just have this generic controller icon on them. So Windows really doesn't know what they are, so it just throws up whatever. And I say that because so that when you look at this one over here, this FT232R USB UART, that is the USB interface that is on my PT actuator controller. But Windows thinks it's a mouse. <laughs> But that's just Windows, you know, nothing you can do about that. So I need to find out the COM port this is on. And again, this is how I do it, uh, just to show it in my videos. And I'll go down to, right click on it rather, and I go down to Properties. And I can see right there, that's the USB UART, and that's what I'm looking for. Now all you have to do is go over to the Hardware tab and click on that. And now I can go down and see what's going on. It's called a Serial Converter. And the main thing I'm looking for is this, COM port 5, all right? So that tells me the COM port that my computer is using to communicate with the PT actuator controller. Now that I have that information, I am ready to proceed. So let's go ahead and close down my devices and printers. And now we're gonna get, up, get SimTools engine up and running. And double click on that. And you don't see it because, well, when it loads, it actually automatically minimizes into my tray down here in Windows. So I'm gonna go down here to the tray and get it. There it is. All right, so this is the game engine screen that you'll be seeing a lot of when you're setting up your system and also using the uh, some tools that are available, and we'll get to all that for tuning your system. Uh, you go, it has a home here, and you can see it's some racing garages or home. And we also have access assignments, and we'll go over that a little bit too. And that's all going to be blank, by the way, when you first open it. Uh, interface settings, that's what I'm interested in for here, for what I'm talking about now, rather. So, I need to tell SimTools what kind of interface that I'm using, first off. And you can see over here there's different interface types. And I can do a drop down here and show you the different ones, all kinds of stuff here. SCN, you know, the SCN actuators, they're, they're a different type of interface than our AMC, which is controlling our AASD15As. So, yeah, AMC is what you want here, basically. And now we're going to go into the submenu here to the output. And this is the interface type under the AMC. 
group. So there's different ones available. I'm going to drop that down, take a look. And we've got a USB one here. We've got MD Box, another popular one a lot of people use. Uh, Nano and yeah, we want AASD15A. Now that we've already chosen that, and you can see my COM port's already in here. But if I do a drop down, it gives me COM port 1 or COM port 5 as options. Well, I know it's 5, so I'm going to click that, and now I'm good to go. I don't mess with the output rate. It defaults at 2 milliseconds for some reason, but I've never touched that, and nothing bad ever came of it, so I just leave it. Something you can play with, though. Okay, so then you save it, and I've already got mine saved, so I don't have to do that. So there it is. Now my SimTools game engine can communicate with the controller. And that's what yeah, we want over the USB interface. And of course, the controller sends information to our drivers, which are the AASD15As. And of course, the drivers will send pulses to the motor to control it. All right, I'm done here. That's all you have to do. Now, if I, the first time you uh, open this up, you've got to have your motion system plugged in or it will, it'll just won't even start. The game engine will tell you there's an error. It can't find a COM port or something like that. I forget what the exact error is. But just make sure that you're connected and you know your COM port before you start it and you're good to go. It's pretty simple, really. Not difficult at all. So that's how you get your motion system and your PT actuator controller communicating with SIM tools. Now that we've completed our interface settings successfully and we can now talk to our controller through SIM tools we're going to go up to, and by the way, make sure you save this, all right? You don't want to leave this without saving. And we're going to go to Access Assignments. Now, this is where you do your mixing of your actuators. And as you can see, I already have some of the fields populated here because this is an existing profile under my default profile. And you will not see anything in the profile fields when you get SimTools open. Because when you first open SimTools, you're not going to have anything in any of these fields. The percent field will have nothing in it. Uh, or be zero, uh, direct, the force will have nothing in it. It'll just be a blank. You'll see that little dash up there. So right now you can see it's populated with things that we need. Now, over here on axis one, two, three, four, five, and six, these are our six actuators, all right? So if we put this on, or rather when we were building this system and you put your actuators where they were supposed to be on the chassis, then this should all line up. One should be your left rear, two should be your left front, three should be your right front, and four should be your right rear. And five should be your traction loss, and six will be our surge. All right. And I'm going to pull a little PDF here that you can download from PT Actuator that gives you a shot of that. Well, actually, it's page seven, there it is, that explains where these things need to be connected. So your actuators, servo one, should be the rear left, all right? Now, on my actuators, it doesn't say servo one or rear left. It actually says axis A, all right? And then the front left says axis B. My, the one I put on the front right is axis C. And the one on the right rear is axis D. That's just the way I got mine. Right, but it's still the same. They could have just used numbers if they wanted to. And I'm going to show you this real quick, this picture in here. And you can see... I don't know how well this is going to show up, but there's a one right here on the left rear and two on the front left and three on the front right and four on the rear right. So that's what they're talking about. All right. So that's axis one, axis two, axis three, axis four. And we don't see it on this because this one doesn't have traction loss, but there would be axis five down here at traction loss. And then up here somewhere we'd have like the surge actuator and that would be axis six. All right. So hope you guys are with me here. <laughs> so as long as you've done that correctly, and it's pretty easy because all you do is you take number one and you connect it to the board up here on servo one. You can see it's got some letters up here, some labels, if you will, servo one, two, three, four, five, and six. And if you watch the build video, you guys know we've already done this and everything should be connected correctly. That's the reason I'm showing you this is because now we're gonna go back into our axis assignments and we can see that there we are again, one is left rear, two, is front rear, three is right front, four is right rear, and five is traction loss. And last but not least, is surge at six. All right, and I'll reference that as we move forward. Now, DOF one, two, and three. We have a five DOF system, but I'm gonna slide this over here and you'll see that we also have DOF four, DOF five, and DOF six, all right? 
And you can see all of these have something in them, even though this is not a true 6DOF capable unit. All right. So we don't have real sway here. And all I'm not going to try. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get you guys up and running. That's the whole purpose of this little segment here. So ignore all this stuff. And what I'm going to tell you to do is because it's all blank, I'm going to tell you to go ahead and fill yours in just like you see here. You can take a screenshot. You can pause the video, do whatever you want. But yeah, here's what you want to do. DOF, if you have a 5DOF system, uh, this will work. In other words, no matter what game you have a profile for or, or that you are plugging for, rather, that you've loaded, the, the machine will work. All right. So all these things will work like they should. DOF 1 should have extra 2 in it. All right. And I'm, I have some, actually have some presets here that I've already been messing with. Set of Corsa, uh, also the uh, Com Competizione, and uh, some other things. So I'm going to click on the iRacing. When I click on the iRacing, you'll see these orange pieces right here go off right there. And all that is is filtering, FLT. So we have percentage of the mix we're going to put in for that force and extra two. Well, how do we know what extra two is? Well, there's one way to find out, but you won't be able to find out when you're doing this. And I'm going to show you, though. There's a tuning center down here. I'll bring this up here and we'll go back up to our access, access assignments. So that was the tools and tuning. And you can see it's, I have some things in here because I've already been running iRacing and it's populated with some minimum maximum numbers. But also, you can see up here in Extra 1 and Extra 2, we have some names here. Extra 2 is actually Heave. And Extra 1 will be Traction Loss. So Extra 2, DOF is Heave, right? Instead of putting Heave in here, we're calling it Extra 2. That's just the way it works. So extra two will be heave, and one, two, three, four, my four corner actuators will be mixing 20% of their movement for that. All right. Now, if you look here, there is no direction change. This is DRR means direction. All right. So if I actuator is moving the wrong way when I'm testing it, then I'll just click that orange and it'll reverse it automatically so it goes the right way. The heave on my unit is all moving in the right direction with all of them black. Over here in DOF2, that's going to be our roll. DOF. All right. So you can see here, I've got two of these red and two of them black. So I want it set up. So one and two are going in the reverse of their normal condition. And then three and four will be in their regular direction. All right. So I'm mixing it so that I can get an actual roll back and forth. If I didn't, it would just roll one way. <laughs> right. So, but again, not important. Important is to put roll in here four times. And then 100%, you can put 20. That's a good starting point. But you can see, because this is my iRacing profile, I have it at 23. And that's just a tweak, all right? And I also have some filtering in here. No big deal. All the filtering is about the same. Here I have nine. So, and that's in smoothing. I don't have any other filtering in here, just smoothing. And that's a plus, or rather, yeah, that's a plus nine, okay? Because if I go one way, that way, it goes down to one. So I'm going to put that back on nine. And all of them that you see are going to be nine. So I'll pop this one up. See, it's nine. So you want them all to be the same because that's an axis that you want to feel the same, right? On all actuators. Very simple stuff. So over here, we move over to DOF three, and that's going to be pitch. And I have 20 on percentage for all those pitch, pitch, pitch. And my second number two and, and the third number three actuator, these axes over here are reversed in direction. All right. So that's all you have to remember that my filter on these is, and again, this is all personal preference and very subjective, is eight. So all of them should be eight. And I'll go down here to the last one and see if it's eight. Oh, yes. So there we go. So we've got extra two, roll, and pitch done. So now we're going to go over to DOF four, five, and six. And four is sway. Now, we don't have a real element of sway, but we put that as a DOF. And you can see the sway, one, two, three, and four, are just my four corner actuators are going to be involved in simulating the sway, which is kind of a, it's really part of the roll axis. And, and it just kind of mixes in a little bit with that. Uh, really, you know, how convincing it is, is up to who you talk to. <laughs> but anyway, sway, 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 and we're reversing direction on one and two. All right. And our filter here is eight on all of them. Okay. I'll go down here and just check that. It should be eight. It is. So all the good there because we're, again, actuators one, two, one through four, and that's our corner ones. Now we're going to move to DOF five. Now DOF five is going to be extra one. There's nothing in, in other words, my one, two, three, four corner actuators aren't doing anything. And extra one is going to be traction loss. I don't need them to do anything one through four to do anything during traction loss, do I? 
So there's no sense in putting them in there. And I'll, of course, go down here and pick the extra one. And my percentage is 100% because, well, that's what I want it to do. And I do have a little filtering on this, six, and also have a dead zone of one. And I'm still playing with this stuff, so you can have this at zero and then, you know, adjust accordingly if you want to. But that's just where I have it right now. It seems to be pretty good, but again, it depends on the car you're driving, if you're in dirt, if you're on a circuit, on asphalt. So these things matter when you get into this stuff. Okay, so you've done that. DOF5 is taken care of. That was an easy one. And I'll go over here for the last one, DOF6, which is surge. And the thing about this is, just like traction loss, I could just say surge 100% and don't even mix in the one through four actuators, right? Because I got pitch, right? We already have pitch over there. So surge is kind of a, it, it works. And I'm still, again, playing around with this stuff. And I'm, I'm, I have yet to take all this off and just run it surge 100% and see what the differences are. But this, again, is something you can play with later on. And my filter over here is going to be eight. Yeah, there we go for smoothing only. So all those are eight, smoothing only. And then I have a filter on the surge itself which is my axis six, and that filter says 12 for smoothing. And that works pretty well, actually. Okay, so there it is. This is all you need to get up and running in a 5DOF PT actuator setup that I just built. So if you get one of these and you build it, all you have to do is fill in these six DOF fields exactly like I have them filled in here, and you are good to go. Just start iRacing or, again, whichever plug-in you have for whichever game you want to run, uh, set of course uh, R Factor 2, whatever plugin you have, this will work and get you up and so everything works. Now you might want to obviously make some adjustments to this later on. Once you get a better understanding of the mixing here and the percentages and what they mean, uh, again, uh, it says 100% in the manual, but you can see here I've got 63 just in three of them, right? So that's 63% of total. And then if I put 25 up there, that makes it 70, uh, 88 actually. And then surge is 20, so that makes me 108. So I'm a little over that 100%. But like I said, I've seen people say that you can go up to like 140% without any bad effects if you want to mix that much in. But again, that's something that you need to learn about as far as mixing your axes for the motion. All right, not that hard to, to learn either, by the way. Okay, so the tuning center, again, we'll be getting to that later on. But right now, I just wanted to give you guys a setup because you're not going to have anything in this when you first fire up your sim tools and you're ready to go racing in your rig. Yeah, it's not going to work. So what we'll do next is probably get to, I'm going to get rid of this. I'll probably go in and do some output testing and see how that works. So now you have all of these fields filled in like you see here, like we discussed in the previous segment, setting up a profile. Okay, because that's what this is. Everything's set up just like I told you. Now it's time to test it. So we're going to go down here to output testing. I'll click on that. And I'm going to go to tell it to turn on. And this is what happens when it turns on. Let me get this over here so you guys can see it. All right, so we're going to turn it on. You can see it rises up to the mid-level. Remember, this is a six-inch travel system or a 150 millimeters. So now what we're going to do is see if these axes or our DOFs are working. So I'm going to do roll first at the top, and we should see the cockpit roll right, or left rather. Yeah, it's going left when I do it this way, and that's right, so don't get confused that just because you're moving the slider right, it goes left. Don't worry about that. And I'll go back to the other direction. You can see that it rolls all the way over to the right. So that's good. Now I'll click on clear here. Next will be pitch, and it pitches forward when we move it to the right, like an ejection seat. <laughs> and then it'll pitch back as we go to the left. All right, so that looks good. And I'll click over here to center it. Now we'll go to heave, and that means just going up and down like an elevator. So let's see. Okay, this one is not working here, but we'll, we'll see it in a minute, though. So hang on. For some reason, it doesn't work here. I think, let's see if y'all works. Yeah, y'all doesn't either. We have to go to the more tab. Let's see, sway, well, sway is, and you can see sway works. And sway is just roll, right? So again, it goes back to my previous thought that, well, you probably don't even need sway in, in here because roll is gonna do it for you anyway. But anyway, we'll see how that works. Now surge, 
And you can see the actuators one, two, three, and four are actually moving in a pitch direction with surge. Remember we mixed that in in the DOF6 with surge. So we had the four actuators in there. But again, it makes you wonder if we really need those four actuators when we have such a, a, a good surge element here in this motion system. So I'm gonna go to more. And now I'm gonna go down to, see extra one and extra two is where it wasn't working before. Uh, so I'm gonna go with uh, extra two, I believe was yaw. No, that's heave, okay, extra two is heave. So our heave is working there where it wasn't before. <laughs> All right, it's fun stuff to play with, especially when you're sitting in it. Uh, extra one is yaw, and you can see my yaw is now working. It's a little jerky on yaw, but it's obviously smoothed out in game. It's not like this. It can be a little jerky when we're testing. All right, so there you go. Everything is working as it should. And that's the important part here. So that's why we're doing our testing. And you can even go in and test each individual axis if you go to axis output. And then 1A should be my right rear actuator, I believe. And you can see my right rear actuator is moving, but the rest of them don't. And typically you don't want to do this because um, that's just a test and see if you got an actuator that's not responding. Because it's much better to do it in the DOF here because then you're actually seeing what you want to see as far as if it rolls right, left, like it's supposed to, or pitches forward and so forth and so on. So there it is, output testing. Now we're going to talk about the SimTools Game Manager. You have to have your game engine and you want your game manager up when you're running whatever game you're running for your motion system. It's a real simple thing here. You can see that this is the initial uh, interface that you see or screen that you will see. And right now we're looking at eye racing. My condition is patched because this is green. All right. Now, if it wasn't patched, let's see if I can find something that wasn't, is not patched. I think I didn't do that yet. There we go. Uh, digital combat simulator is not patched. And you can see it's kind of a pinkish color there. All right. So if I want to patch that though, first I'm going to go in here and the rest of these guys, yeah, they're all patched. Compensione. I uh, said, so of course, uh, live for speed. I don't even mess with that. That's like a default one in there. I, I don't know why it's there, but that's just concluded with them tools for some reason. Uh, R3, yep, that's uh, race room. That's patched. So yeah, when you download your plugins, remember we went over the SimTools plugin updater that you have to use to install your plugins, but we still have to patch each one of them. And it's just the way this stuff works. And if I had something that is not patched, I would go in here and go, let's go ahead and just patch this, see what it does. And you'll say, okay, go to this tab here. It says patch. I say, I want to patch this. Boom. It says, okay, you sure you want to? I say, yeah. Well, it doesn't really say that, but I'm going to patch the game. Click on patch game. And then it will ask you, would you like to patch? Yes, please. And please select DCS saved games directory. Okay. So I don't have any saved games directory in here. So I can't patch uh, DCS yet, okay? And that's, that's not uncommon. I mean, there's some things that uh, you have to do a, a couple little things to make it patch correctly, but most of them will go in well. And when you're done patching, you just hit patch again because all of these, uh, both of the set of courses in the iRacing and the race room all patched without, a, without a, a, any problems at all, no problem. So I'm gonna go back to my eyes racing over here. So once you see it green up there, then you know it's patched. So now that we've done that, let's talk about what this is really for or where you're going to spend most of your time doing with the game manager. And that's your profile editor. So we'll click on that. And there you see it, it comes up with iRacing because, well, that's what we're going to be messing with. So select a game iRacing. Again, I can change that in here anytime I want down there. Select a game. Intensity level is currently 100%. Now, this is kind of like a, a general broad sweeping brush here with the intensity level. Um, all, everything will get changed when you use this, all, all of your uh, DOFs. But of course, I usually like to be a little more granular than that. So I'm going to go up to the editor tab and see what we have here. As you can see, I've already got a couple things changed here. My heave is up to seven and my surge is five. The rest I just left alone for now. And also you can select your profile. You can do custom profiles anytime you want. You can copy an existing one and then rename it. You know, it's very good for managing your profiles, which I like about this particular application. All right, so if you've got too much roll and you want to bring it down, I'll go on the roll slider and take that down a few ticks and see what that did. Now, you can do this live, so it's immediate reaction in-game, so that's very cool. You know right away if the changes worked or not. If I had too much roll, I would go back the other way, obviously. All right, or rather, if I didn't have enough roll, excuse me, 
Yeah, that's what I meant. And this red button over here just centers it back to zero real easy in case you get lost or you, or you don't want to mess with the slider and you just want to go back to zero real quick. All right, but there's more to play with. And I'm going to go over here to the more tab. <laughs> Traction loss. All right, that's extra one. Heave is extra two, All right? So we can actually do traction loss and heave settings in here too. Extra three is not used because, well, the game knows that because I've been running iRacing and it calculates all this thing and recognizes what I have or don't have. So here again, we can change whatever we want in traction loss or heave, increase or decrease it as you wish. Remember, all this stuff couldn't be more subjective as far as what you want out of your system. Plus, just because somebody has certain settings on their PT actuator 5DOF system doesn't mean that it's going to be good for your system. These are kind of they're like their own identity, each system that you build. And they're all going to react a little bit differently. So you have to tune them that way. Right. So what else do we want to see up here? I guess that's about it. And I'm going to go ahead and get into a live tuning session. But when I do that, I'm going to go down here and I'm also going to have the tuning center open. And this is a tool that helps you tune stuff. It also has an auto tune function. Create minimum max down here. And I'll talk about that when I'm using it. But it never really works for me. It, it's usually really way dampened and, and hardly any motion compared to what I want when I run that. So I will fill in these fields myself. And I won't change this unless I need to but after I've done something up here because it's easier to do up here. But if I want to tweak something, I'm going to be down here in this tuning center, right? And you can see I've already gone. Usually you start out with 10s all the way across, except, of course, for y'all. You always want that to be a positive and negative 180. And then you go from there. So, yeah, 10 is usually where I start, but as you can see, I've already made some adjustments for roll and for my surge, and I've got some extra two, which, of course, remember, is heave. If we go back up here and look at our axis assignments, let's see, where's extra two? There it is. All right, that's in my DOF1, and, of course, it also says extra two is heave down here. Another good way to tell which one is which, if you forget, and you can do that when you're using this stuff a lot. You go, well, which one was heave? Which one was traction loss? All right, so... These are the two main things I'm going to use to tune this and, of course, my editor over here. And I'll just mess with these in between and see how things work. But usually I'll just go ahead and put 10 across the board on everything or some, maybe even 15. Depends on the track and the car because this system really changes or can, can really change on you how it feels just from going from uh, different cars and tracks. It really does a good job at that. So you'll be wanting to adjust these things. So what we'll do next is go ahead and get into a live tuning session where I'll just go over some basics and try to describe what I'm feeling before we get to our real driving segment. All right, guys, I want to get in the car and just do a quick little live tuning session. And that's just showing you how these sliders work and how you can change things in the tuning center and the results we get from that. It's not going to be a very long session, I hope. <laughs> so, First off, I'm going to, we've got the game manager up over here. Of course, our game engine is over here. And I'm going to go to the tools in the game engine because there's a very important tool in here called the tuning center. And you've seen it before if you've been watching this video. And it just allows us, I seem to spend more time over here doing my tuning adjustments than I do up here in the game manager. Now, the game manager obviously has a profile editor. And you can see my game selection is iRacing. And I can't change it now because I'm actually in the game. And profile selection, i got a couple of them in here. And you can generate those, obviously, and save as many as you want. I'm going to go to the profile editor, and that's what this screen looks like. And you've seen this before, too. Now we have the selected game. The intensity level is 100. I can actually change that if I want, which changes everything. It makes mutes everything, if you will, as far as when you bring it down so it's less force. And it makes it more comfortable if it's too harsh for you. This is a simple way to do things. I'll go to the editor now. And you can actually adjust, like I said before, the roll and pitch and things like that. And we'll do that. But you can also adjust it down here in the tuning center, which is a little more precise. It doesn't take as much of a change here to exact. Uh, it takes more change up here. You have to move the slider further to feel the same kind of change. It's just by changing this by a couple of digits, really. It's really pretty sensitive over here. But it's not something you probably want to use from the first time. You want to spend your time over here first in the profile editor. But I wanted to show you this. Uh, while we have it up here, because it is an important part. All right. So what I'm going to do is everything is zeroed out here, and I'm going to let you guys see what this does with my tuning center settings the way they are, which is pretty pretty good as far as the way I like it. Um, some people might think it's a little too harsh, but again, all this, by the way, just like I normally say, is subjective. All right. So just because my settings are something 
doesn't mean that you're, you're going to enjoy the same type of settings. It goes with anything when it comes to motion or force feedback and that kind of thing. So anyway, further ado, let's get in the car and see what this feels like. And you can see the chassis actually moved a little bit when I got in the car. I got the volume down, so it's not going to interfere with me talking too much. All right, and any jiggling metal, metal sounds you hear is the seat belts. All my harness stuff is loose. I pulled it back and it's, I draped it over the, because it's kind of just hanging on my tower back there. So every once in a while, the, the metal will hit something and make a noise. So it's not the chassis making that noise, just in case you were wondering. All right, so this is where I usually am as far as driving this car, the Ferrari at Sebring. And I got a little bit of yaw snap there. And you don't, I, I don't use yaw a lot because in circuit racing, yaw is really great on dirt, right? Rally cross, rally racing, that kind of stuff. Uh, it really lets you, when you're sliding sideways, it really gives you a great feeling. But in circuit racing, usually if you're feeling a lot of yaw, you've already lost it anyway. You're already in a slide. You're going to feel the slide start first in your direct drive wheel than you will in the yaw part, all right? And you can save it before the yaw ever comes into play because you felt it in the wheel, right? Your tires, your front end got loose and you could feel the rear end wanting to come around. All right, and you, can, you might hear my voice shaking a little bit because I've got the heave pretty, um, pretty detailed here for the, the bumps and the cracks and stuff in this laser, laser scan track from my racing. And I go over the, the rumble strips there. I can actually feel the rumble strips, not only in my direct force wheel here, there's my DD wheel, but I can also feel it in the chassis when I'm going over those rubble strips. Now, not all of them in iRacing rumble the same. Pretty good ones here, though. And you go across these, and you can feel that pretty good. But some are better than others. All right. So this is how I usually have it. And you can see the spike filter. See when I hit the wall? That spike filter that's in this controller from PT Actuator running the Thanos board does a wonderful job with that. All right. So I hit the wall there because I was talking about concentrating and but it didn't give me a big shock so the spike filter is working and where i have my settings on the spike filter which you guys should already have known if you watch the other segments is working pretty good for me and here in i racing in this car anyway all right so that was me basically driving there you can see i don't have a lot of roll um it's, there's some roll in there which is i don't want a lot of roll but you can actually dial that up and we're going to go ahead and start making the changes here i'm going to go to roll number one and I'm going to crank that up to about, I'll just go ahead and crank it up to like 25. And now let's see what the roll's doing. You don't have to save it, by the way. It just works. And not only that, but this profile, it will, if I close everything down right now and bring it up, it'll still be on 25 when I, I bring up this profile. I can already feel the difference in the roll. Just the, the sway, the weight transfer. So you can see, I got more exaggerated roll now. But I had to move it 25 just to get a little bit more roll, at least what I consider more roll, out of the car. I could have done the same thing in the tuning center under roll in just a few digits, and it would really be rolling. <laughs> so that's why I kind of like it. It's, you don't have to change as much. I'm going to go around this turn here. You just want enough roll, at least I do, to give me the weight transfer, the feel of weight transfer from, as the car suspension settles on one side or the other, depending on which way we're turning. And this actually feels okay. It doesn't feel that bad. Of course, I'm getting yaw now because I'm sliding. But anyway, that's how I would change the raw, uh, the roll rather. Not the raw, the roll. Okay, so I'm going to leave the roll there. And I am going to, let's go to, hmm. What do you want to change next? Let's try pitch. I'm going to take pitch up to 25. And you saw me pitch on the braking. Well, before we do that, let's, let's see what it looks like as we're focusing on it. And I'm going to go ahead and do a braking zone here as we come out of this hairpin. <laughs> and watch when I transition over this bump section right here. It really matches what you see in the car as far as the suspension moving. It's very quick system to be, and it does it really well. Okay, here we go. You can see how much pitch I've got. That's a pretty good amount of pitch, but pitch is also part of the surge element in the DOF of surge. So there's always going to be some pitch, even if I turned it all the way down. But what I'm going to do is, now that we saw that, 
I'm going to take pitch and I'm going to turn it down 25. And we should see less pitch next time I get on the brakes hard. Oh, 25. There we go. So let's see what that does. There's still pitch there, but I think it's definitely less than it was. But again, because we have pitch on our surge axis also, in other words, on my surge DOF, I've got all four actuators, one, two, three, and four, in there at 20%. So they're always, when it surges, they're always gonna pitch too. So pitch is kind of a tricky thing once we have it in the surge DOF also, even though it's its own DOF. So, so we're still getting some pretty decent pitch there. What I'm going to do is, even with it turned down 25 there. All right. So I'm just going to clear that out because that didn't really change much. It didn't feel like it changed much. I have to watch the video, see what happened. What I'm going to do here is go into the pitch on my tuning center. And to change that, I go to capture minimum max. I have to push that. And then it says it's actually capturing now whatever I do as far as driving the car. You can use this as a pre-tuning tool also, kind of an auto-tune. You run a couple of laps with it in the capture start the capture mode rather, and then you can adjust your settings from there. But I've never really gotten very good results from that. It was always way too soft and slow, kind of lethargic once I did that. So I, I have some basic settings I just use in the tuning center for all my stuff and go from there. Anyway, that's just something that you learn. Now I'm going to take this pitch and I'm going to change this from 10 to 20 and see if we have any change there. And you can see when I changed the 20 and the max over here in this max minimum fields, the minimum changed to negative 20 also. But if you go down in, in the pitch number, it doesn't change. You have to change both of them, and that's just the way it works. So I'm going to save these settings so they take effect. I'm going to stop my capture, and then we're going to go down here and do some more braking and see what happened. So, so my skid marks there. All right, here we go. See how much pitch we're getting now. It still feels like, of course, the surge with surge pushing you forward, it's kind of hard. But I think we got less pitch for sure here. Keep going here. This this Ferrari just doesn't start very fast. Let's slip the clutch to get it going. If you want to start real quick. Yeah, I think it's just the surge. I'm not getting quite as much pitch as before. So I did move it ten points in the tuning center to get that. So, yeah. Of course, I have to look at the video to see for sure. It's hard for me to tell sitting in here while I'm looking at them what they're actually doing. But it feels like there's a little less pitch in my surge. And to verify that, I'm going to take that back to 10 again. And I'm going to start first. I got to capture, start my capture, put it back to 10. And again, the bottom one doesn't change. So I got to go back in there and change that one to 10. No big deal. But and once you learn the system, it's pretty easy. Save those settings, stop my capture. And I should get more pitch now. There we go. All right, let's get up to speed. And here we go. I'm kind of looking over the actuators. Yeah, I definitely feel like I'm getting more pitch now. But again, I'm going to have to look at the video. And you guys can see it in real time in the video. So anyway, these are the two things that I want to show you on what you use to adjust this. And tuning your suspension system is totally subjective. So again, your suspension system is not going to react exactly like mine does because they all kind of have their own characteristics, even though they're the same parts. That's just the way this stuff works. So it'll get you in the general area, the, the settings that I have, if you wanted to put them on yours. But again, you're probably going to end up tweaking it to your own style and what you like to feel because everybody does that. So that's about it. That was the live tuning session. I don't want to get too far into this and spend too much time on it because, again, it's such a subjective thing. I just want to show you how I usually go about changing things. And remember, we do have to save in the tuning center, but we don't have to save over here in our profile editor, which is probably where most people are going to want to get started. I'm going to clear that out. Where most people are going to want to get started if you've never been in Sim Tools before. It's easier to use that profile editor. Over here, you got to learn it a little bit, even though it's not hard to learn. And yeah, then you can do it in there. So yeah, so that's it for our live tuning station. Now I'm just going to go and see what this system is capable of. We're going to do some more driving here at Sebring. Then we'll get into some dirt and just see what the suspension can do as far as the travel. Of course, we've got six inches, so it should do quite well in jumps on the dirt. 
And then we'll do, yeah, we got to see how noisy or not noisy this system is. So we'll get all those segments next. So here we are in iRacing and we are at Sebring and we're in the Ferrari 488 GT3 and you can watch the textures I'm getting out of this track. Look at this. This thing is really dialed in to where you can feel every little bump in the road, which I think is important because yeah, it, it gives you, even though your direct drive wheel gives you all this information, or at least it should be giving you all this information, it's better, or not better, but it's, it's just more involving and convincing when you have your chassis doing the same thing you're feeling in your steering wheel. And that's what this does with the heave, the way you can dial this in. Very, very convincing. And it also gives you information about skipping over bumps and where you might lose traction because you hit a big bump and be able to correct for it not just because of what you're feeling in the wheel, but what you're feeling in your body, which is a unique experience for sure to be able to do that. And there's a lot of four actuator systems out there that are capable of that. It's just one of those things that I like to mention here, that heave is such an important element to have in these setups, all right? So yeah, watch me coming across this bump. I want you to watch the, the car and the chassis. Watch how it goes. The chassis moved exactly the same as the car suspension did as you're looking through your windshield. And that is very cool, and that's the way it should be dialed in. So yeah, very convincing and very immersive. Now I'm going to take one of these sections away here so you can see this tower in action. I call it the harness tower. <laughs> I'm not sure what else to call it. And this was originally developed by JC at JCL Racing, as far as I know, because when I reviewed his system, that was on it. And it really maximizes the surge effect. Without this tower, you're really missing out on, I would say 80%, if not more, of the effect that Surge is capable of delivering and the immersion on top of that. This thing, when you go into a braking zone and you feel the shoulder harness is pulling against you at the same intensity with the waist belts pulling on you too, that is very, very convincing. Just a, a shoulder harness tensioner is, I mean, it gets the job done giving some tension on your shoulders. But yeah, a lot of those, as I explained in that segment, pull straight down behind your seat, which is really just push, pulling straight down on your shoulder muscle between your shoulder and your neck in there. And it's not the same as in a real race car because it pulls straight back like you see set up here. And because the, the harness for your shoulders are going straight back into the roll bar somewhere and they're attaching them there. So that's, a, a, not only that, but it's a less fatiguing type of pull on your shoulders, straight back instead of straight down on the bottom. So a lot of tensioners that I see on the internet with guys on videos, that's the way they're set up. And yeah, you need something, some rollers or something to get those belts from pulling straight down on that neck muscle because it will fatigue you after a while having that pulled on you. Not only that, but your waist belts are not being pulled. And that's a big part of this whole system that you're seeing here. When your waist gets pulled in or those waist belts tighten up just as much as your shoulder does, it just transforms you into not only that, but you can feel the detail of what the car is doing under braking. Yeah, it's just an amazing experience. And yeah, if you have a surge system, I highly recommend you build this. It's not very complex. It doesn't require, you know, more motors, more wiring, pulleys, uh, you know, all that stuff. Another driver for your for the actual servo that you're driving, using it to turn the pulleys or however you have it set up. It's just a lot less complexity and a lot less maintenance and worry. Uh, yeah, moving forward when you're in your driving experience and maintaining your cockpit. So yeah, highly recommend this. And you know, overall here, there's really nothing I can find to complain about. Uh, you know, you're getting true 5DOF, it's very accurate. SimTools allows you to dial this in just about any way you want to. And again, there's a lot of support for SimTools on the forums and on the internet in general, if you just look for it. So there's a lot of guys out there that can help you with the settings on this and the setup. If the ones that I gave you in this video review on part three here, uh, don't meet your needs or you have some issues with it, but it should work. Right, so now we're over in the dirt truck, the Lucas Oil Truck Series in the Pro 4 truck. And I always go over here to really push a system, a motion system to its max and see what it does, how it responds to the abuse that it takes going over all these jumps. And yeah, it's a, um, it's a blast anyway. If you guys never tried this, I uh, highly recommend you just go out there. It's just for fun. You know, I really haven't been in a real race with these Lucas Oil trucks, but it's a lot of fun just to go out and, and jump these tracks. And of course, you can always bring a rally car or, or a rally cross car from iRacing over here and run it too. So anyway, you can see that, uh, yeah, we're doing a lot of jumping here. 
uh, just one after another. Uh, so it gives me a good feel for what the, the system is capable of. Also, it'll let me know if there's anything loose, if there's uh, you know some unnatural rattling going on or a squeak, if you will, uh, you know that needs some oil or something. So this is a great litmus test that you've built the system correctly, and I would call it a good shakedown, if you will, uh, attracted to use the system on. And yeah, it's a lot of fun too, by the way. That's probably the main reason I do this. It's just when you're strapped in tight into the belts here and you're, you're, you feel like you're really in that truck and experiencing all the forces that, you're, that that suspension will get when somebody's in one. Of course, we don't have real G-forces here, but this uh, PT Actuator 5 DOF system uh, certainly uh, really gives you a lot of feeling and a lot of immersion, if you will, in this type of racing also. So yeah, I mainly use this for, again, uh, airing everything out and seeing if it behaves like I think it should. And like I said before, it's just a blast to do this. And I highly recommend it if you guys have not tried this. Again, it's not something that I want to do all the time, but in circuit races is my favorite part of driving a race car. But yeah, this is a lot of fun in its own and any dirt really, but uh, like a dirt track car. I actually went and did some of the uh, dirt track uh, oval racing in the car. And yeah, that was a great experience too. But yeah, this is really where you can push things and see what's going on. And not only that, but I am going to give you guys a little test here, which and I'm just gonna turn the sound off and you can hear what the system sounds like with no sound. And this also, I'll do this regardless if I'm doing a video or not, also to see if there's any squeaks or any rattles that shouldn't be there um, and, and go to and chase them down basically and fix whatever it is. Because you know, these are kind of a complex system here and it's got a lot of bolts and a lot of nuts and a lot of things that you can miss when you're tightening everything down for the final time and you can still miss things. So this is a good way again to find out if you did miss anything. But you can see that this thing's got a lot of motion you know, six inch actuator travels. This is where these things come into their own and can really deliver the goods as far as getting about as immersed as I imagine you can in a simulator running something like one of these dirt trucks. It's a pretty awesome experience actually. Right, so we'll go ahead and get to the silent running and then just give you an idea of how loud at maximum abuse this motion system actually is. you guys probably figured by now, this is the silent running section. So we're going to just let you listen to the system a little bit, just to get a general idea what the noise sounds like. Not too bad considering all the motion we're getting out of this, I think, is, yeah, the, we're getting a lot of motion out of this thing. So, yeah, for the sounds that we're getting here, I think it's uh, pretty quiet for the kind of travel that we're getting. Yeah, for sure. Final thoughts on the P2 Actuator 5DOF motion system. This is the last of a three-part video review series of this PT Actuator build. I've already published the first two called Part 1, the build, and Part 2, wiring and cabling. This does reflect the complexity of this 5DOF system, but I believe anyone that is handy with tools can get it done, especially now that you have my videos to help you sort things along the way. There were two updated parts I received during this build, and I think this shows the commitment of PT Actuator to continually improve on this kit when the need arises, and they're always looking for ways to improve or tweak on the components that they make. I also tested the third-party e-stop unit from Bajer. I like it and really I think you should give it a look if you need an e-stop that is compatible with the PT Actuator control unit. The default software that is used with PT Actuator's kits is Sim Tools, and you will get a pro license for free with this kit and some of the other kits that they sell. There are other software applications available that you can also use with the PT Actuator kits, like this very interesting looking app here called Fly PT. 
but I use SimTools for this review. SimTools is not the most user-friendly tuning software, but it's very learnable if you take some time to do it. And there are good support forums and groups if you look around for them. I was able to get my system up and running without too much drama. Speaking of running the system, it is a very immersive experience, <laughs> as you might imagine. Whether I was driving in a circuit car configuration or a dirt configuration, it was easy to dial in the settings I preferred. I really like the surge element in this system, but to fully realize the capabilities of it, I highly recommend you build the harness tower used on mine, whose design was developed by JC of JCL Racing. Having the waist and shoulder harness belts pull against you at the same time with equal pressure under both regular braking and engine braking conditions gives you car control cues that were previously just, well, not available. And no extra motor mounts, drivers, pulleys, or wiring to worry about. I also want to let you guys know that PT Actuator also sells complete kits with three or four actuators that you can expand upon later to a full 5DOF kit. Overall, I think there's a lot to like here with this system. A true 5DOF motion system chassis for $9,500 plus shipping, which should be around $1,500 to North America. And I think most would agree this is a bargain, relatively speaking, of course, <laughs> and something that is easier to build than you might think at first glance. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.